Celtic, welcome to you. Today we're going to look at chapters 4 and 5 from the book of Galatians and try to better understand what Paul is teaching that church. As you remember, the Galatians were Celtic, and so if you are Celtic, you are distantly related to them. We're going to be celebrating Celtic culture in the form of this hat and our music. Let's go. In chapter 4, Paul picks up describing what he means by the promises of God through faith. And in order to explain this, he's going to use an Old Testament Bible story, which you may remember from Genesis. This is the story of Hagar. And it's kind of a disturbing story in some senses, especially you feel bad for Hagar. Now, if you remember, God had promised that Abraham would bear a son, and that through that son, ultimately, God would fulfill his promise to Abraham of bearing uh, many children, having a great nation descended from him. And even more than that, this ultimate covenant promise about sending a savior, uh, God had said that through Abraham all nations would be blessed. Now, at this time, Abraham is extremely old, his wife is old, she's been barren her whole life, and women of her age don't get pregnant anyway. And Abraham is concerned that God's promise might not be fulfilled. And so he says, well, maybe it's going to be God's promise in a sense, plus some of my own help. Maybe God needs a little bit of my help. And so a common practice of the time was that when a, wo when a wife, when a man's wife, especially an important man, could not bear children, but they really needed there to be a legal heir so that the property that they had could be transmitted to somebody, it was common that the man or the husband would uh, sleep with another woman, usually a slave or servant in the house, and this other woman would kind of then be a surrogate for his wife uh, in, the, in the sense that she would then give birth to a child that would definitely be at least descended from the father, and this child would then be regarded as if it were the child of the wife who wasn't able to bear children. You know, it's kind of, you know, say, well, this, it's kind of problematic. Uh, and so this is what Abraham and Sarah suggest. In fact, I believe it is uh, Abraham's wife. It, she's the one who suggests it and puts forward her servant, Hagar, who probably doesn't have a lot of choice in the matter. And so Abraham sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. And she gives birth to her son, Ishmael. And you know, the hope is, okay, is he the one through whom God will fulfill all these promises? And, of course, we know that's not how God wanted it to work. And as Ishmael grows up, um, it's kind of creates tension between Hagar and her mistress, Sarah. Uh, you know, in a sense, every time Sarah sees Ishmael, she's reminded of her failure as a mother, uh, physically unable to bear children. Hagar, in a sense, is able to put on airs, or at least Sarah can see it that way. Further complicating matters, as we know the story later on, Sarah actually does give birth to her son, Isaac. And so now you have these two sons of Abraham, and there's some age difference, but, you know, they're, they're sort of in the home there, growing up together. And you've kind of got two boys here who were uh, conceived, you know, as potential heirs to Abraham, and more than that, heirs to the promises that come through God to Abraham. And so these two women, Hagar and Sarah, and these two boys are pointed out to us by Paul as sort of like an allegory for how to describe two covenants. So we pick up here in Galatians 4.24, where Paul says, now this, this story, may be interpreted allegorically. An allegory is a story where characters represent bigger truths, especially spiritual truths. Um, well, there's a lot of stories that are allegorical, like the Chronicles of Narnia are kind of an allegorical. Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory. And so Paul's saying you can actually, you know, this story is history. You know, these people actually lived and they did these things. But it's also like an allegory. These two women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where Moses gave the law, so representing the law. Bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. 
the Arabia connection here is also because Ishmael ultimately ends up being the forefather of the Arabs. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. I'm skipping down here a few verses. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. Now, if you remember in the story, ultimately Sarah comes to the point where she demands that Abraham cast out Hagar and her son Ishmael, which, again, it's kind of rough for Hagar. She didn't ask to be part of any of this. Certainly her son Ishmael did not say, hey, I want to be born so that I can threaten the inheritance of Isaac. But Sarah says, Abraham, you can't keep this woman and her son in our house. And her point wasn't the point, you know, her, her point wasn't to be a jealous wife, but to remind Abraham that he needed to trust fully in God's promise, not in his works. So sleeping with Hagar represented him trying to do a work to help God keep his promise. Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Because Ishmael it was not produced by faith, but by works, Abraham trying to help God, he does not share in the inheritance that was promised only for the son, Isaac, born by faith. Verse 31, So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So in a sense, what Paul is saying is, we need to see ourselves and identify with Isaac, who was born miraculously through God's power alone as a fulfillment of God's promise. And in a sense, to keep the child of the slave woman around is like trying to hold on to our slavery to the law, like we can earn our salvation through things that we do, instead of relying 100% on God's work to save us. So Paul uses this story as a way to illustrate this principle. And he's warning that the Galatians need to not rely on any works. In particular, there were people in that church trying to say, you need to be circumcised and put your faith in Christ. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Circumcision does not contribute to your salvation one bit, nor to any other act of obedience to the law. Doesn't mean it's wrong to obey the law, although circumcision was no longer a, a requirement of the law. But it does mean that when you're counting on things for your salvation, look alone to God and his promise fulfilled in Christ. Now, as heirs to Isaac, the son of the free woman, not the slave woman, Paul is saying that we have been likewise set free and that we should not submit again, as he says, to the yoke of slavery. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So you're saved by faith alone, not faith plus doing the right things, being a good kid, going to church, having the right family, getting good, right? Faith plus anything is a return to slavery and a failure to put your faith completely in the promised work that God fulfilled in Christ. Now this is uh, where we see, well, oh, Paul, how do you really feel about you know these people preaching that circumcision is required? So we pick up here in verse 10, where he's now trying to, again, make sure that the Galatians are not going to follow along with the false teachers. And he says, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, meaning no other view than that you're saved by faith alone, and that the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Paul doesn't know exactly who's teaching these things, but he knows it's bad. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Yikes. If you don't know what that means, I'll tell you when you're older. But I don't think you can find a stronger statement from Paul about how angry he is at people who are preaching that you need to add something to faith in order to be saved. He says, whoever this is, they need to stop punishing or troubling you and they should receive a penalty. 
All right, so the last section here in Chapter 5 is interesting. So we've got this idea that by being saved through faith, you have freedom. You're no longer earning your salvation. So you can imagine if somebody was paying off a debt, like if somebody had, I think we've used the example before, like an enormous debt of student loans, and basically as soon as they graduate or don't graduate, either way they have to pay back their student debts, their life is pretty much going to all focus around anything they can do to keep up with the payments, right? Whatever they wanted to do, forget about it. You take whatever job you can get, work however many hours you can get, and make those payments or, you know, so basically their life is over as far as what they want to do. But if the debt is paid, then you have freedom. And you have this question, okay, so what are you going to do with all this new time? What do you actually want to do with your life? And Paul puts that question to us spiritually and saying, okay, you do not have to earn your salvation. So you have freedom to do things. What will you do? And he says, it was for freedom that you were freed. You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So we've talked before about how some people say, well, if you tell people that they don't have to earn their salvation, then they're going to do wicked things and it's kind of like they get a get out of jail free card because of Jesus' work on the cross. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, in this sense flesh meaning those wicked desires that you inherit by being descended from wicked human beings. But he says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So use the freedom you have as an opportunity to show love for people. You were made free from the requirements of the law so that you could then do things like showing love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So Christians have this option or this alternative. Okay, you're freed from your sins. You're not required to earn your salvation. That's really good news. So what are you going to do? Are you going to use your freedom as an opportunity to do wicked things, or will you use it as a way to show love? And Paul's going to sort of expand on that, that new, those two versions of what freedom can look like here at the end of chapter 5. And he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So here we have reintroduced the idea of Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit that gives you faith in the first place, the purpose for which faith is given is so that you would repent and believe and then do things or bear fruit in keeping with the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit saves you so that you can go on to do good, not so that you can, as it says here, gratify the desires of the flesh. And he enumerates some of these. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And here we've got a, a pretty long list. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And he's going to go on to say that the people who practice these things do not inherit the kingdom of God. Right? The whole point of going to heaven is to not have a future with any of these desires of the flesh, but to have a future in holiness. You are saved to be holy. You are changed so that you would no longer walk in these wicked ways. Does that mean that you're being saved by not participating in sexual immorality and purity? No, no, no. What it means is that you are freed not just from paying for your salvation, but you're also freed from pursuing these perversions. Your freedom is so that you can now do what is holy. This is contrasted in the next verse where we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. And we've talked about a lot of these even in school devotions this year. So it's a kind of a neat thing to think about here. But the fruit of the Spirit is, you probably know these well, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Right? So these things are not against the law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So union with Christ by faith means walking away from the flesh and its perverted desires. 
in order to have the freedom to pursue the fruits of the Spirit. You get this sense here in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So get on board with the program initiated by the Holy Spirit. You were saved so that you could bear fruit. Get in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. So in chapter 5 here, we see this contrast, the flesh versus the spirit, and we see the contrast coming out of chapter 4 of slavery versus freedom. Slavery, in a sense, you could see it as, you know, those who are trying to earn their salvation, they're enslaved to the law. For those who aren't even trying to do that, they're, they're simply enslaved to the mm -hmm. desires of the flesh, which lead to death. Those who pursue them, as we saw, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But for freedom, you were set free being led by the Spirit, so that you could pursue holiness. Your salvation is intended to make you free so that you can bear the fruits of the Spirit. All right, so you want to go ahead and make sure you do the next Galatians note assignment through Google Classroom. I think you guys are mostly getting the hang of how to submit those. If you're having any technical trouble, please shoot me an email, um, and we'll try to help you figure out what you need to do. Really important that you guys keep up with these things right now. These notes are fitting into the grade category that your memory work would normally fit into. I'm still trying to figure out if there's a way for us to continue doing the memory work that we had been working on before. It's kind of difficult to make that work digitally. Uh, if I find a way to do it, I'll let you guys know. But otherwise, make sure you're reading now through the end of Galatians. And uh, next video, we'll start to talk about Ephesians. So we'll uh, look forward to that. You can go ahead and start reading Ephesians now. All right. Have a wonderful Celtic day.